So we're going to talk about leprosy tonight, mainly, and I hope that you are as blessed as I was just in studying it. So turn with me to Leviticus, Let's see if this works, chapter 13. So grab your Bibles with you, turn to Leviticus chapter 13, let's see how far we get through this and ask Abba to do amazing things as he describes his word. How many know every single word is here for a reason? Everything that he puts in his word is there for a reason. There's not one word, not one, let's just say, jot or tittle that's there without purpose. It has a purpose. And so we're going to read it tonight. And so although tonight's reading may be a little bit strange to you, maybe uh, uh, you read Leviticus when you can't sleep, okay? Uh, Most of you growing up in church, they skip the book of Leviticus. It's not exactly the most exciting book. Uh, from some's perspective, I think it's one of the most exciting books in all of the Bible. Uh, there's so much in there. It's deeper than gold, in my opinion. So we're going to begin and see what Yahweh does. The very first verse says, And Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When a man has on the skin of his body a swelling, a scab, or a bright spot, and it becomes on the skin of his body like a leprous sore, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of the sons of the priest. So the priest shall examine the sore on the skin of the body, and if the hair on the sore is turned white, and the sore appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a leprous sore. Then the priest shall examine him and pronounce him unclean. But if the bright spot is white on the skin of his body and does not appear to be deeper than the skin, and the hair has not turned white, then the priest shall not isolate the one who has the sore for seven days." shall isolate the one who has the sore for seven days. So basically, if they determine that it's leprosy, they're unclean and put out of the camp completely. If they determine that they're not sure, but it seems a possibility, uh, they they put them in isolation for seven days. And then on the seventh day, uh, on Shabbat, they will will come to the priest and the priest will examine them. Uh, How many know that it's amazing to me that the word doctor and the word rabbi come from from the same word? Because this is many times what the priests are doing. This is a doctor's uh, duty. He's he's checking a medical condition. So let me ask you a question. Do you think that there were medical doctors back in ancient Israel? Of course. Absolutely. So why go to a priest? Why go to a Kohen? Go to a doctor. This makes a lot of sense. Makes no sense. Why, are they, why is Yahweh giving? Matter of fact, what's amazing to me is God is so smart, He knows what leprosy looks like. So He's writing a medical journal for what leprosy looks like and what it doesn't look like so that they know how to pronounce someone clean or unclean, whether or not they can come into the temple or not. We're going to discover a little bit later why He's telling them to go to the priest and not to a leper, or excuse me, to a doctor. So the priest shall examine him on the seventh day, and indeed if the sore appears to be as it was, and the sore is not spread on the skin, then the priest shall isolate him for another seven days, so 14 days. Then the priest shall examine him again on the seventh day, and indeed if the sore is faded, and the sore is not spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is only a scab, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. But if the scab should at all spread over the skin, after he has been seen by the priest for his cleansing, he shall be seen by the priest again. And if the priest sees the scab has indeed spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is leprosy. So there is something really important about this particular disease that the priests are really concerned about. This is not something they take lightly in ancient Israel. You don't take it lightly now because the disease still exists overseas in many places. Look it up online. It's one of the most terrible diseases you'll ever see. So this is something they cannot have spreading throughout the camp. They must quarantine, isolate, and take care of that particular disease because they they are so worried about it spreading and and becoming a plague. And as you know, plagues in ancient Israel are not something that that they look forward to. Ever since leaving Egypt, uh, I would imagine that they had in their conscience, we don't want to have happen to us what happened to the Egyptians. And uh, how do you keep plagues off of you? 
follow the Lord God. How many know in the, in the, in, in, uh, in the near future, during the Great Tribulation, during the book of Revelation, what comes back? The plagues. Who does it affect? Those that are not following the commandments of God. Those who do not have the seal. But if you have a seal and you know what the seal is, then the plagues don't affect you. may aggravate you. may bother you. may scare you to have a hundred pound hailstone hit you, hit right next to you. But you need to even know what the seal is. How many know that the Bible defines what the seal is? It says the seal. It's put on the forehead and the hand, right? We've been, as believers, in every denomination across the across this planet, we have read the book of Revelation, going on a quick rabbit trail for a moment, as if it's isolated unto itself, like it was not written by a first century Jew. That they had no clue what the Tanakh or the front of the book or what they called the scripture said about the end of time. So when he says the, the, the seal on the forehead and the seal on the hand, we just read it in the Shema, in Deuteronomy chapter 6. The seal of God's people is his commandments that he puts over us. That's what he says. What well, David says, in my mind, I meditate on your mind day and night. Shema, hear, in my mind, I meditate on your word, your Torah, the word is in Hebrew, and I do it. I hear it and I do it. That's why the Shema says, write your commandments on, in my head. Put it, your seal on my forehead and on my hand. And Yahweh says in Jeremiah 31, then I'm going to take it, I'm going to write it on your heart as well. So not only do you know it, not only you do it, but you have my spirit to do within you the way that I want you to do it. So you have not just the obligatory or the understanding like the Orthodox do. You don't just do it because you're checking off of a list, but you have his heart. No different than a husband that knows that his wife wants him to take out the trash. And he does it, but to do so cheerfully is a whole other thing. Ask any teenager... So I'm just going to read through here because uh, I'm going to show you, I believe, when this is all said and done, the incredible spiritual significance of leprosy in the Bible and what it really means. We're going to skip down to verse 12. And if leprosy breaks out all over the skin, and the leprosy covers all the skin of the one who has the sore, from his head to his foot, wherever the priest looks, then the priest shall consider. And indeed, if the leprosy has covered all of his body, he pronounces him clean who has the sore. Isn't that interesting? If the leprosy has traveled the entire length of the body from head to toe, he's clean. Why? There's no more flesh. You see, when I say, when we're talking about clean and unclean, The reason why it's unclean when there's leprosy is because the leprosy is destroying flesh. It's death. When there's no more flesh to be destroyed, from the biblical definition of clean, it can't kill anything else. It can't destroy the the actual flesh. So he he pronounces it clean. I'm going to come back to a spiritual reason of why, because that's kind of confusing if you think about it. But there's a reason for it. So he goes through, and he goes through about about the bright spots in one place, and if it spreads, and all these different things. And it's incredible the detail that the Bible gives on to the doctors, the rabbis, the, if you will, the teachers of the law, the priests, of how to handle people that have bright spots, scars, scabs, Flesh that's opened up, white hairs, black hairs, yellow hairs, the detail is incredible. So let's move and find out where else leprosy is is mentioned in the Scriptures and to find out exactly what leprosy represents. Because the reason why Yahweh's having them go to the priest and not to a doctor is because this is a spiritual condition He's trying to connect for all of us. Leprosy is a spiritual condition as much as it is a physical condition. How many believe that whatever you see in the physical is a representation of the spiritual? When there's a famine in the land, Yahweh says, I'm sending a famine of my word. Just coincidentally, they line up. Numbers chapter 12, please. 
We're going to stay within the book of Torah. The books of Torah, just one book over. This is an amazing chapter. So we have Miriam and Aaron, right? Kin to one another. Right hand next to Moses. Miriam and Aaron spoke against... Well, let's just back up a little bit here. No, we can start there. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman which he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. So he marries an Ethiopian woman. He has the right to marry an Ethiopian woman. And they get upset with him. Moses is not around when this conversation happens. So they said... Has not Yahweh indeed spoken only through Moshe? Has he not spoken through us also? And these next four, these next five words are incredible. And the Lord heard it. You see, Moses wasn't there. They knew Moses couldn't hear him. But they're speaking against Moses, the Mashiach. Did you know he's called a Mashiach in the Scriptures? Because Mashiach simply means anointed one. Okay? Yeshua was the Messiah. The Mashiach. He was the anointed. The anointed one. But there were many Mashiachs. Every king was called a Mashiach. The anointed one. A prophet was an anointed one. Moses was anointed. I mean, he was called and ordained by Yahweh to accomplish a particular task in the earth realm and given the authority in the scepter of Yahweh to lead the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. So if there were any issues amongst Moses, Miriam and Aaron were not the ones to make judgment because judgment only comes from the the authorities over the one that you're speaking about. Let me say that again. Judgment only comes biblically from the ones that are in authority over the one being judged. This is why I cannot judge a police officer. I have no right to do that. What am I required to do? I go to the authorities, and the authorities deal with the police officer. Does that make sense? Okay. So here's what happens. Miriam and, Miriam and Aaron think that they're just talking by themselves. And I love those words. And Yahweh heard it. The next words out of Moses, out of Aaron and Miriam's mouth were, uh oh. You know, sometimes we speak and we think nobody can hear, but the reality is is that if your theology, you believe what you believe, but you say you believe that God is everywhere, omnipresent, He's there. So He's there, and He's also in the presence of the one that you're speaking about. That means that by default, the one that you're talking about is in your presence. Because if you're, especially if you're both believers, there's a spiritual connection. It's called Yahweh. So you're spiritually connected to this person. So let's see what happens. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Want to be in leadership? Be humble. Big problem in leadership today, isn't it? Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, count out, come, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of the meeting, to the Mishkan. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle. Folks, this is like seriously being called to the principal's office. (laughs) Like there is no tomorrow. Then the Lord came down on a pillar of cloud, stood in the door of the tabernacle, and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Good choice. Then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in dreams. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all of my house. 
I speak with him face to face. Word in Hebrew there is panim. Presence to presence is what that means. Even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. And, when, and, they, and then were you, were you not afraid? Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? In other words, I chose Moses. There's no other like him in the earth realm today. I'm the one that chose him to lead you and be your spiritual authority. Why are you not afraid of me? Amen. You should be scared to death to speak against the anointed one, right. is what he said. Right. But apparently, Miriam and Aaron, you don't fear me because you don't understand that I'm standing behind Moses even when he makes mistakes. When Moses makes mistakes, Miriam, whose problem is that? Because I didn't put you in charge of leading Israel. I put you in charge of being a leader of Israel, but not charge of leading Israel. So if you've got a problem with Moshe, the best thing that you can do is go directly to Moshe. And if Moshe doesn't listen to you, you probably ought to go to the 70 elders. And if they don't, then you probably ought to just lift it up to me because I'm a pretty big guy. I can handle Moses. And he did. Nobody had to go to Moses to discipline him. Yahweh disciplined him himself. And he was left out of going into the promised land. There's no better disciplinarian than the king. Amen? Amen. Remember that. So here's what happened. The anger of the Lord was aroused against them. And he departed. I want to stop right there because an entire message can be given from just that one sentence. Listen to this. The anger of Yahweh was aroused against them and Yahweh departed. When we sin, listen to this, Miriam and Aaron's verbal one-liner. Who does Moses think he is? Is You think he's the only one that God speaks through? It's clear that the Lord uses us too. Pride, arrogance, and Lashon Hara, slander, the evil speech against a brother. Within 30 seconds, the anger of the Lord aroused against them, and Yahweh's Spirit departed from them. This is the seriousness, ladies and gentlemen, of speaking against one another. When you speak against a brother or a sister, and you judge them, and you're not their spiritual authority, You are placing yourself in the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Messiah. You are taking the spot and the seat and the authority of the the Mashiach of the universe. You're taking him by the hand. You're pushing him out of his seat. You're sitting in the seat of judgment and you're judging. And the moment you do that, I can assure you, you walk into any king's palace today or a thousand years ago, and you kick the king out of his chair, you're probably going to have death real fast. The Spirit of the living God will remove himself from your presence. This is serious. Every idle word, the Bible said, is recorded. So he departed, and when the cloud departed from above the Mishkan, suddenly Miriam became leprous, white as snow. Then Aaron turned towards Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O my Yahweh, O my Adonai, this is the original OMG right here. Please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when she comes out of her mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her, Adonai, I pray. Golly, guys, what an amazing leader. This leader of Israel just finds out that one of his top leaders said something evil against him. Questioning his leadership, speaking Lashon Hara against him. And his response is, Father, forgive her, for she knows not what she does. 
No wonder he was chosen to lead all of Israel. He loved even his enemies, even if they were family. Father, heal her. Please heal her, even though she's done this great sin. And and Yahweh said to Moshe, if her father had but spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut up out of the camp seven days, and afterward she may be received again. So Miriam was shut up out of the camp for seven days, and the people did not journey till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward, the people moved from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Now, what's really incredible about this is Yahweh is keeping His word that He just gave. He just gave Torah law saying that when someone has leprosy, but you're not sure if it's leprosy, you're to bring it into the priest, and if they determine that it is leprosy or not leprosy, if it's not leprosy or they're not sure, they put them out of the camp for seven days to see what would happen. Now, what's Yahweh doing? She has leprosy. Technically, she should be put out of the camp, period. Why does he say for seven days? Because that's not what the Torah says. Because he was in the midst of maybe changing his decision. In other words, it's not sure. The priest is not sure. Yahweh, the highest of all high priests, says, I just gave her leprosy, but based on the prayers of Moses... I'm going to give her seven days to repent. If she repents in that seven days, she'll come back, and if all is clean, you will deem her clean, receive her unto yourself again, and she can come back into the camp. So it's in the balance. 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Nahaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was, was a great and honorable man in the eye of his master. Because by him, Yahweh had had given great victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was also a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Nahaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were the prophet, were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Nahaman went in and told his master, saying, thus and Thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I Elohim to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to heal me to heal him of his leprosy? The king of Israel has no idea what to do. Talk about an oblivious king. He has absolutely no clue of spiritual things. He has no idea that the very first thing he should have done is called the prophet in. This is a a, a matter of, of supernatural. Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me, meaning that he thinks it's a setup. If you don't heal him, we're going to go to war. So the king's getting nervous. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes that he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. There is confidence in those who follow the king of Israel. It wasn't that he was going to say, bring him to me and I'll pray and see what the Lord does. He said, Bring him to me, and he'll know that there's a king of Israel. So in verse 9, Nehemiah went with his horses and his chariot, and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. And Elijah sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be tahor. You shall be clean. But Nehemiah became furious. Wait a minute. Nahaman comes here because he wants, he wants to be healed of leprosy. The guy has leprosy. Consider that cancer in today's world. You've got cancer. You find out there's a prophet in Israel that can heal your cancer. You go to the prophet clinic, and the clinic doctor, the head prophet doctor says, here's what you need to do to be healed of cancer. Stop eating Twinkies. And you say, are you kidding me? No way am I doing that. 
and you get angry. How on earth can we get angry at the doctor for telling us exactly how to heal, get healed? This makes no sense until you understand that this is way bigger deal to be baptized in the Jordan River. Let's, let's, let's watch this. There's a huge spiritual principle here. And went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord as God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. So Nahaman's expectation of what the prophet was going to do was come out of the house, take out his magic wand, put it over his head like some, you know, pixie fairy dust, you know, and heal him. In other words, the expectation was on God, not on him. The humility of the man should have been, Father, show me what I should do, and I will do whatever it takes, because the most important thing for me is for your name to be glorified, and I believe your name will be glorified if I'm healed. He gives it away in the next statement. Are not, are not the Abana and the, and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went in rage. Do you know why that Nahaman cannot be healed at this point? Because he's not from around here. Where is he from? He's from Syria. Syria is not exactly always on the best uh, side of Israel, even today. Some of the worst enemies ever. Not always, but overarching, yes. He could not humble himself to be dunked baptized or mikvid immersed in the Jordan River because he was a Syrian. The pride of a Syrian was not allowed to go and be mikvid into the Jordan River. There's spiritual, physical, and emotional connections in the lands thereof. It's different than it is today. Back in ancient Israel, in the ancient times, the land had meaning. There was pride in it. The, the kind of pride that you get when you, when you were watching NCAA basketball tournament. People were proud. I was in Buffalo Wild Wings the other day having lunch with our, our, our staff. And uh, the Cardinal game was on. We were watching the Cardinal game. And on one of the other televisions with a, was a, uh, a soccer game. And it was Barcelona playing another team. And there were four or five guys in there uh, that all had uh, Barcelona jerseys on. And they were all speaking Spanish, yelling at the television. They had pride for their team. They were wearing the team shirts. What would it be like if I said, here's what you need to do. I'm a prophet. You want your team to win, right? Here's what you need to do. You need to take off your Barcelona shirt, and you need to put on the other team's jersey. If you do that, your team will win. They would go, are you insane? I am not taking off my shirt and putting on the shirt of my enemy. I don't care what you're saying. You're crazy. That's exactly what's going through his mind. He, was not, he had, did not have the capability of humbling himself for the greater good, for the greater glory. His servants came near and spoke to him and said, um, Abba, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the sayings of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. Here's an amazing thing. What he doesn't know is he's following Torah. Because what happened? He was deemed unclean by the priest, the prophet. The prophet told him exactly what to do. Go immerse yourself in the Jordan River seven times, one for each day, if you will. He said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to follow the Torah that you're telling me to follow. So his servants came and said, are you crazy? If he would have told you to do something that would make you look good, you would have done it in a heartbeat. How much more getting clean would make you look good? And he submits and humbles himself to those that he was over. It's the ultimate humility. He's following New Testament Scripture. He's submitting himself one to another. He was in charge. He was the authority. 
but he understood that his servants knew him better than anyone, and he was willing to submit himself to his servants. You see that? Because he submitted himself to his servants and listened to the instruction that his servants gave, he was able to follow the man of God, follow the instructions of the Torah, of the prophet, and he went and immersed himself seven times. Let me ask you, what if it had just been six? I mean, seriously, it's pretty humiliating to go under the water once, twice, I mean, at some point he's thinking, oh my goodness, this is ridiculous. He doesn't want to be there. He's already humbled. He's humiliated because he's doing it in a Jordan River, not in a Syrian River. What if he stops at the sixth time? How many times have you immersed yourself when you're looking to be clean, when you're looking for a miracle in your life, when you're looking for a breakthrough, when you're looking for bondage to be broken, when you're looking for the chains to come off of your ankles, when you're looking for a word from God, when you're looking for your son, your daughter, your spouse, your children, when you're looking for a new job, a new house? What if you're, when all of your looking, if you stop on the sixth time? We are created, ladies and gentlemen, to be immersed seven times. You need to go back to the Father over and over and over again. You have to press in because you don't know at which time that the Father says, that's it. That's the time that you get healed. I don't know why sometimes I'll lay hands on someone and I'll get healed or how sometimes someone will come to me and I'll get a word for them, but I don't get a word from over here. I know our prayer partners, it frustrates all of us. Why is it? It doesn't make sense. How does one person get healed from bleeding and another person not get healed from this disease? Both are, are, are hurting. Both are in pain. What causes the Father to do what He does when? It's not our problem to even ask those questions. We pray and then we thank Him for the answer. Yes, no, or maybe. So if He chooses not to heal someone, how do you know it's not for the greater glory? What if he doesn't want to heal them in front of 3,000 people? He wants to heal them in front of 300,000 people. Where's the greater glory? Abba knows exactly what he's doing. Would you press into the Father seven times, over and over again? This is why when people did the Nehemiah Challenge, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go to the NehemiahPrayerChallenge.com and watch the short video and take the challenge. This is why so many miracles happen in people's lives during that challenge. Because they pressed in every single day for an hour of prayer, 30 minutes of the Word, two hours of community service. And they saw miracles happen in their life. Second Chronicles chapter 26. You're going to see a theme here. There's, there's authority, there's submitting to one another in, in, in love, even those that were, were over? I cannot tell you how many times, ladies and gentlemen, with six kids, that, that I get, I've been frustrated at one of my children. And, and I've snapped at them. How many, any parents in here, please at least one person raise your hand. Have ever snapped at the wrong kid? One of them's doing the wrong thing, and the one of them's doing the right thing and coming and tell you, Dad, 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 be quiet! Go to your room! I'm just trying to tell you that Malia is walking out the door naked. <laughs> That's happened multiple times, I think with all of our kids. But I cannot tell you how many times that one of my children has said, Dad, but have you ever considered this? And then I say, you know what? You're right. You're only four, but you're right. And I need to submit to that. Truth, it doesn't matter where it comes from, right? We need to submit to it when it comes to us. Pride people, prideful people do not submit to anybody. So therefore, they cannot get instruction from anybody. Where were we? Uzziah reigns in Judah. Verse, chapter 26, verse 1. Now all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. Wow, that's saying something. 
He built Eleph and restored it to Judah after the king rested with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Yekaliah of Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of Yahweh, according to all the fa- his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Did you hear that? As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Now he went out and made war against the Philistines, broke down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabna, and the wall of Ashdod, and he built cities around Ashdod and among the Philistines. Adonai helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians who lived in Gerbaal, and against the, the Meunites. Also the Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah. His fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt, for he became exceedingly strong. And Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, at the corner buttress of the wall, and then he fortified them. He also built towers in the desert. He dug many wells, for he had much livestock, both in the lowlands and the plains. So he has all this success. He's growing in stature. He's a great leader. His his reputation is spreading far and wide. Uh Uh-oh. Pride goeth before what? Many men of valor. He made devices in Jerusalem, invented by skillful men, to be on the towers and the corners, to shoot arrows in large stones. So he had mechanical devices. He was inventing things. His fame spread far and wide, for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. But when he, but when he, had, when he, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against Yahweh his Elohim by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of the incense. Now wait a minute, what's wrong with that? He's all excited, he goes into the temple to to offer incense because he, he wants to give tribute to his God. You see the problem was, well let's just read, the Bible's a lot better explaining it. So Azaziah the priest went in after him. And with him were 80 priests, 80 Kohen, valiant men. See, not all priests were wimps. These were warriors. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah became furious, and he had a a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord, beside the incense altar. Azariah, the chief priest, and the priest looked at him. There on his forehead, he was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place, because he's unclean. You're not allowed to go into the temple. Indeed, he also, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day he died. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper. For he was cut off from the house of the Lord. You know what I find interesting about this particular scripture? Uzziah had leprosy where? On his forehead. You know what we say today in the English idiom? We say you got egg on your face. Why did he put it on his forehead? He could have put it anywhere on his body. But he put it in the one single place you can't see. The only way that you could see the leprosy on your forehead is to look into a mirror or to have someone pointed out to you. But see, the problem of why leprosy stayed with Uzziah is because he didn't allow, when the priest came in and corrected him, he grew in such stature that he took a position that he was not given. He became authority over the whole land at 16. And for 50 some odd years, Yahweh gave him the ability to stay in that authority. But he was only, his authority had a limit 
to the territory that God gave him. He said, this is your authority. This is your gifting. This is your grace I'm going to give you. You're a worship leader. You're not a plumber. Please don't touch the plumbing. Plumbers, please don't touch the guitars. Stay with inside of your grace. But when he got to the point where he took over another territory that wasn't his without the permission of the Most High God, Yahweh struck him with the leprosy. Now what's amazing is when did he strike him? Let's read it again. Uzziah became furious. So the priest came to him and corrected him, rebuked him. Yahweh gave him a chance to humble himself right there in the holy place. And he chose not to humble himself. And what happened? That's when he got the leprosy on his forehead. It was because he stuck his chest out at the authority. Because he thought he was the authority and judge. I'm the king, you're just a priest. Not knowing that the priests have authority over the kings. The prophets are the ones who ordain the kings. So who's truly the highest authority in the land? The prophets. The spiritual authority over the king. He chose not to submit himself, and so he died. Yahweh gave him a chance because he allowed the authority to speak into his life, and he had a chance to submit, and he didn't. Husbands, when was the last time your wife came to you and said something, gave you instruction, and you spurned the reproof, not knowing that you're spurning a priest? If you were out of line and you were both priests in the house, isn't it her duty to tell you that you're out of line? Happens to me all the time. And here's how it normally happens. I'll open my chest to you. Maybe you'll learn something through my mistakes. Last night, my wife and I had uh, something happen that, that, that caused her to remind, something that didn't even have anything to do with me, reminded her of something in my past. And so it brought up feelings of, of negative feelings of something that happened in, in our past. What did I immediately do? Instead of putting my arms around my wife and, and making her feel better and submitting to that emotion and that feeling, I did what every terrible husband would do. You can't bring that up. I already apologized for that. <laughs> and I started quoting Scripture. It's as far away from the east as the west. You're listening to Hasatan. We need to pray right now and rebuke that evil spirit that's on you. As I'm crushing my wife deeper and deeper, pulling myself into quicksand, taking a two-minute issue and making it two hours. Men, anybody know? Please raise your hand. You've been there? Okay, thank you. Every man that's been married longer than three minutes knows what I'm talking about. What I should have done is I should have submitted to the instruction. I didn't even know it was instruction. It was emotion. It's like having a three-year-old that, that runs across the living room. She's not supposed to be running across the living room, but she falls, scrapes her knee, and I spank her. What on earth would a husband, do, a father do that to their, nobody would do that to their children, hopefully. You would immediately take your, your daughter in your hands and make her feel better, and then deal with the instruction later. Husbands, do this with your wives. Ladies and gentlemen, do this with your friends, your coworkers. When you see an issue, when you see a problem, embrace the problem first and make it better. How many remember back teen? Old enough to remember that, okay? It's probably like causes cancer now. I don't know why you don't see it, but the commercial, the back teen commercial was always the same. They they get their the, the rug burn or they get hurt on the street, and back teen made it all better. All you did was spray it on there and made it all better. Making it all better is submitting to what the other person's trying to say, listening to what the other person is saying, embrace their pain, their hurt, and it makes it all better. 
And in the process, what you don't know is you become better. Because you're king of your house, men. When the priest tells you that something's wrong, your job is to submit to what the priest is saying, or at least listen to the priest. Listen to your other half, the other priest in the house. Take some and validate those things, and guess what happens? You become a better king in her eyes for sure. Ladies, amen. Amen. There's your marriage 101 lesson for today. (laughs) Where are we at? 2 Chronicles 26. So listen to what he says. He says, Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. So we learn in here that you can, you can get leprosy, spiritual leprosy from your mouth, from speaking against God's anointed, speaking against anybody. Did you know that there are people that judge other people prematurely? I know you don't know any of these people, and you've never met them. But there are people that live to judge others. Man, can you believe what she's wearing? I can't believe that. Can you believe her hair? I can't believe she got to turn yellow. She's had her hair every color of the rainbow. <laughs> you believe he lost his job? He deserves it. I even heard recently someone judge me. I know that's a shock. No one judges me. I live in a king size bed, or I sleep in a king size bed. And someone actually said, told one of my children, Oh, he's sleeping in a full-size bed. Good. He needs to sleep in a full-size bed because I slept in a full-size bed for 13 years. He needs to know what it feels like. Ladies and gentlemen, that's terrible. I mean, it may be true. Me and my wife, we're closer. But we're not allowed to judge one another like that. When we make mistakes or things happen in our life, what are you supposed to do to one another? You're supposed to cover one another. We'll come back to that. Let's read James chapter 3, one of my favorite books. The original name is Yaakov. It's not James. There's no such word as James. It's Jacob, actually. But let's turn to James, chapter 3. Let's see what he has to say about this. It says, My brother, let let blush about the body of the tomorrow. And since I have the gift of interpretation, I'll say it says this, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers. How apropos is that verse for that time? The Lord has a gift of humor. Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. This is incredible that this scripture is part of what the context is getting ready to lay out. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in their word, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the entire body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouth that they may obey us, and we turn the whole body. Look also at ships. Although they're so large and driven by fierce winds, they're turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among the members that it defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of nature and is, on, is set on fire by hell itself. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh water. He starts out this entire chapter of the untamable tongue by talking about teachers. Because teachers are put on such a high pedestal, are they not? As if we cannot make a mistake. Did you know that there are people watching this program right now that are recording this program to parse out my words, create another video to post on YouTube? That's not a good time to say amen. 
<laughs> All they want to do is to try to record my words, twist them, manipulate them, judge me, and then try to humiliate me. What they don't know is I'm really good at humiliating myself by myself. I do not need any help. And what they don't realize is this. The Most High King is recording every word they say. Every action that we make. Every word we say, every step we take, every thought that we have is recorded. And if you don't want it to be played on Judgment Day, you love people, you forgive people, you cover their sins, you look out for your brother, you lift them up when they make mistakes. Every time you cover your brother, the Father says, what's He say? Every good work covers a multitude of sins. Whose sins do you think it covers? Every time you make it out to you, for your motivation is to expose a brother or a sister in Messiah, even if they deserve it. The Father on Judgment Day will expose you to the host of heaven. And you will lie in the dirt in shame. When you take the judgment seat of Christ, ladies and gentlemen, you better be able to receive the judgment from Christ. Let me say it again. If you are willing to take the judgment seat of Christ, you better be willing to accept the judgment from Him on that day. The only one that you have the right to judge is the one that Yahweh has given you authority over. If you're a father, you have the right to judge your children. Do you not? If I have a problem with one of your children, is it not logical that I go to you? I'm not going to go to your child. I don't care if he's 17. I'm going to go directly to the authority. And dads are sometimes really good at dealing with 17-year-old sons. My boy did what? I don't know about you, but I, I remember my, my dad saying, Son, and y'all can finish this. I brought you into this world. I can take you out. And there were many times where I said, I believe, I believe. <laughs> Recognize, ladies and gentlemen, this tongue and the motivation behind it can lift up and set captives free or it will put people in prison. And if you put someone in prison with your word, your tongue, you're putting yourself in right there with them. You may not see it. You may not recognize it. But it's happening in the spiritual realm. We're almost done. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Tree is known by its fruit, amen? amen? You can say someone's evil all day long. I don't need to know anything about a person. Let me meet their children. Amen? Amen? Because if this Bible verse is true, you'll know them by their fruit. Well, the fruit of the womb. Let me meet your children. I'll tell you what kind of parents they, they have. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be. Listen to this. It uses a very serious Greek word here. It does not say judged. It says condemned. Do you hear that? What does Romans chapter 8 verse 1 say? There's no condemnation for those that are in Messiah Yeshua. So what is this saying? Because this is saying that by your words you will be condemned. If you call yourself a believer in the Messiah, you have to grapple with this. 
If you, are, if you are pulling people down, if you are condemning people, if your motivation, and even if, you, if, you're, if it's not your motivation, if you have loose lips to speak evil against your brother or your sister, your husband, your spouse, your children, your leaders, your spiritual pastor, your, your, your leaders in Congress and, and government, the Bible says it's illegal to do that. You can only judge when you're the judge so here's the way i look at it because i'm an uneducated person i look at it this way pretty simple i don't need to judge someone unless it's under inside of my realm of authority that yahweh has given me there are protocols biblically that we deal with that but someone outside of my realm of authority i don't need to judge them you know why they're already judged They're already judged by their judge. This is why the Bible says, love your enemies. Because if you had any idea what's coming to them, you would feel sorry for them. If you knew that they were getting spiritual leprosy, cancer, being put outside the camp, miserable for the rest of their life. If you knew their spouse, their daughter, was going to die in a car accident the next day. Don't speak judgment against people so in my simple simple mind this is what I say if Yeshua the Messiah waits until at the end of the thousand years to throw people into the lake of fire and judge mankind then I think um, I can probably give people uh, that grace as well we do live in an age of grace still it's coming to an end and he will judge by his law whether we think it's valid or not. You can tell a police officer when he pulls you over, sir, I don't agree that that speed limit sign should be there. It shouldn't be 55. It should be 70. He's going to say, I appreciate that. Take it up with the one who wrote it as he writes you a ticket. Psalms 101 says this, listen to this, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. And you know we live in an age of social networks, don't we? Facebook, MySpace, your space, everybody's space, and whatever the next space will be, outer space. But everybody loves to be on their social networks and on the internet and say what they think, don't they? People are like warriors online. It's an understatement, you're right. They are the biggest, baddest Nephilim giant that the earth has ever seen from their living room with their slippers on. But in person, they would never speak. People actually create fake YouTube and fake Facebook accounts to slander people. I'm at the top of the list, by the way. Did you know that this scripture says, whosoever secretly creates a Facebook account and YouTube account to slander his neighbor, him I will destroy? And you think I'm joking, that's exactly what it says. You're trying to slander your neighbor behind their back, Miriam and Aaron. Miriam and Aaron just simply created a fake Facebook account, said, sent a message to Moshe, I disagree with you marrying that woman. Because they didn't have the audacity or the courage or the brave heart to stand up to him themselves and say, I disagree with you. Let's dialogue about this. I love you. You're my leader, but I disagree with you. You may be right, but can we dialogue about this? Because we're brothers. We're mishpachah. Miriam is not going to take a grenade and throw it over the wall while Moses is in the holy place. But for all too common, we throw missiles from our living room to people online. We throw emails to people, and we say things we would never say. We put in all caps. We yell at people. In all caps, did you know that's what all caps means? I just learned that last year. 
I only use all caps when I say hallelujah or amen. Because unless you would do it in person, don't do it online. Don't yell at people. It's disrespectful. Don't instruct people or rebuke people. It's wrong. It's disrespectful. It's judgmental. You're not the judge. The Bible says to correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and gentle instruction. Whatever happened to the gentle instruction part? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what just happened to love? What happened to it? You could spend an entire message going through 1 Corinthians 13. What's it called? The love chapter. And it says, love covers a multitude of sins. It covers your brother. What does that mean? That means when your brother sins, you cover them. When Noah was naked in his tent, what happened? Two of the brothers, two of the sons, walked in backwards to cover him in his nakedness. One of them tried to expose it. The one that tried to expose it, listen to this, if you're listening to me tonight and you've made these mistakes, it's okay. But don't make it again because what happened to the, to the son that made that mistake? All of his generation and his seed were cursed. All. Not just him. His son was cursed and all of the generations after that. Because of that, when you try to expose sin, listen, ladies and gentlemen, there's only one person in the universe that exposes sin. Hasatan. He is the one that stands in the third heaven before the throne and accuses the brethren, does he not? So when you accuse your brethren and say, can you believe he did that? Can you believe he did that or she did that or he said that, she said that? Most of the time, you're going to be wrong anyway because you don't have all the information. But you are playing the part of the adversary. You might as well be his puppet because the only person that accuses the brethren is Satan. I want you to take yourself back 2,000 years. We're at the Last Supper. We just had Passover, so many of you can know what the experience would look like. They're lying on the floor at the triclinium table. Judas is right next to the left of Yeshua. Did Yeshua know that Judas was the perpetrator of his death? Did he know that he was going to betray him? Did he know all along from the moment he was chosen as a disciple that he was going to betray him? Why didn't he stop it? If there was any time in the history of this world that any man had the right to stand up and say in front of all the disciples during the Last Supper, Judas is the one. Even the disciples said, who is it going to be? Yeshua could have stopped it, stopped his death, and therefore stopping the salvation for all of mankind. He chose to give Judas a chance to save face all the way to the very end. He never judged him. The son of the living God did not even judge the one who handed him over to the enemy. He let his sin find him out. You see, if someone's truly in sin, if someone is truly doing something wrong, how long does it take before they really start walking in curses? Where their sin finds them out. There's an old saying, give them enough rope, they'll hang themselves. If someone is not from Yahweh, they will hang themselves. If they're from Yahweh, you'll see nothing but fruit and blessing. But you know what? It's not your job to choose to judge your neighbor. Your job is to lovingly instruct your neighbor. The judgment that the Bible is talking about, it says, do not judge, Matthew chapter 7, lest you be judged yourself. But if you do, 
understand that the same judgment that you do will come back on you. Judgment starts with the household of God. Biblically, we are allowed to judge one another. But in English language, the word judge is turned into condemnation, not gentle instruction. True judgment is a judge that stands in a courtroom and a 16-year-old kid that's underage does something wrong and the judge says, here's what you're going to do. Here's your penance for your job. You're going to do community service and here's what you're going to do and you're going to meet with this counselor and then you will be clean, quote unquote. A true judge does not say off with his head. A true judge gives instruction. For the benefit of the one that's under judgment. It is your job as believers in Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, to give instruction to one another. Because if we're all instructing one another, guess what we're doing? We're becoming sharper. Every one of you is a tooth on a gear. And every time that you come up against one another, it's not going to feel good. But you become sharper and sharper, and pretty soon, you can take a gear, brand new gears, and put them together. I used to to build engines when I raced the motorcycles, and you could always hear the engine. It was kind of louder when you first built an engine. Why? Because the gears are seating. It's called seating. They're seating with one another. Let's just say they're sitting with one another. They're creating covenant with one another. So they're rubbing the sharp edges off one another, so they're becoming to look alike. And the more they look alike, the more they they rub one another, the quieter the engine gets, the smoother that the engine gets, and the, the better and faster that engine will go. If it has the oil of the Holy Spirit, and we stay in covenant with one another, all of the issues work themselves out. You might come across and go, go through 33 gears and everything's fine. All of a sudden, you come across a gear that really bugs you. But guess what? You stay with one another, and the gear comes back around, and there's another 35, gear, uh, 35 teeth on the other gear that's rubbing this guy down. So the next time he comes around, he's a little bit smoother. Maybe you're not the only one that's supposed to make him right. Why don't you trust the rest of the body of Messiah? This is why everyone must be in in covenant with one another. This is why, husbands, you have to talk to your wives. This is why, wives, you have to talk to your husbands. With due respect, they are your king. Children, take the, and absorb the instructions of your fathers. Congregation, take the instruction of your your leaders. If they mess up, remember, they're human. And when we go home and we're Uzziah, and in public we say, we're not doing this. And we go home and our servants, our wives and our children, say, honey, bad move. You need to do this. Trust that if the body of Messiah works, maybe that person will come back and repent. And if they don't, ladies and gentlemen, it's not your problem. You just have to stay on the gear. Because if one single gear comes out of that engine, the engine stops. And I submit to you, over the last 1,800 years, the gears have been flying off the springs left and right, and you're always trying to gather back the gears and say, stay in place. Here's the deal. You get in the right covenant with the right people, with the right oil and the right law, and that machine will run and you'll see life, and you'll see life more abundantly. Amen? Amen. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, love this. Learn this as a child. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that you may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run a vain or labored in vain. Do not miss the promised land. Do you realize that the only reason why people miss the promised land is because of complaining? It's a sign. It's the number one sign of weak faith is when you complain. You get a a, a flat tire on the side of the road. First thing you should say is, hallelujah, I got a flat tire. I'm going to meet roadside assistants and they're going to come to know the Messiah today. Because while they're changing my tire, I'm going to give them the gospel the whole time because they're paid to change my tire. 
True story, driving in my truck. And my daughter was in the back seat when I got the news that uh, the gentleman changed his mind about uh, letting us rent his house. And, uh, and, I, and I, said, I said, we need to pray because I just got bad news that uh, we're not going to be able to move in the house. My daughter's on my iPad playing a game, and she says, awesome! <laughs> I'm such a blockhead, I didn't even catch it. So I said, no, you don't understand, honey. <laughs> I thought she misunderstood me. I reiterated it. She goes, I know, I heard you the first time. That's awesome, Dad, because now we get to see a miracle. As I hung my head in shame, <laughs> Pastor Jim is learning from his, six, his 11-year-old, you know. At least she's listening to my sermons. And I instantly changed my attitude. Ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly how the gears are supposed to work. I made the mistake of falling into my flesh, and my daughter was right there to pick me up and say, Dad, that's great news. Great news. We're about to see another miracle. Never did I see, matter of fact, let me say that what Yeshua said, in all of Israel have I not seen faith like that. If only we could be like little children and actually believe what we read. We need to believe what we read. So here's the formula for life. Just a few things I, I, I wrote down. Submit yourself to the spiritual authorities in your life and physical authorities. Be nice to police officers. Most of us, you get pulled over and the first thing you do when they say, do you know how fast you're going? What do we say? I have no idea. You know exactly how fast you're going, just admit it. I dare you, the next time a police officer pulls you over, he says, you know how fast you're going? Sir, I was going 78 and a half miles an hour, eight miles an hour over the speed limit. I deserve a ticket, and I appreciate you pulling me over and doing your job. After he picks himself up off the ground, <laughs> watch what the Lord does. Let me ask you a question. Who... Who have you given authority to to correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction? Answer that question right now, wherever you are, online, wherever you are, in here. Answer the question in your head. Who have you given yourself up to and said, Sir, ma'am, I want you to speak into my life. I give you full permission that if you see anything wrong with me, I will submit to it. I will not question it. So help me God. Because you know where all the problems in Israel came from? It's the same place today where all the problems in the Messianic movement come from. People that do not have an answer to that question. They do not have one person that they submit to. So therefore they become the ruler. They become the judge. They become the king. So they walk into the holy place not even knowing what the law says and they end up with leprosy, and they wonder why they're outside of their destiny. If you don't have someone in your life, now I understand that some of you live in places where you, you, can't, uh, you can't do that. You're not in a community yet. Pray the Father brings that. And until then, maybe turn to your spouse. Turn to someone that you, you, uh, you, you uh, look up to spiritually. Speak into my life. I am constantly asking people, speak into my life. Tell me the things that you see. I want to know. I only have two eyes. I have no idea who's behind me. If the enemy's behind me, tell me. I want to know. If I'm making mistakes, tell me. I want to know. I want to be the best leader, the best pastor, the best shepherd, the best daddy, the best father, the best husband I can be. Don't you? You won't be that until you're able to humble yourself to someone and put yourself under because when you put yourself under, you're becoming a servant. And my Bible says when you serve, you become the leader. You're not qualified to lead until you serve. Find someone and yoke yourself with them. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, I think we end with this next slide. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. You can't not 
See, that's uneducation coming through right there. I only went to uh, uh, high school education. We have to be in covenant with one another, and we have. We cannot forsake the, the meeting together of the saints. If you are local and you're not sick, you don't have the right to stay home and watch me online. That's not covenant. That's not mishpachah. That's not being in, in, in communion with one another. It's convenient, but it's not in communion. We are commanded to be holy convocating together. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say this. Do you believe that or not? Because holy convocation means it's a set-apart kadosh gathering of His people for a purpose. To grind one another. And it's not just sitting in a chair. Hang out for a little bit afterwards. Find someone that you don't know. Introduce yourself. Say, hi, how are you? I know I don't know you, but I want to submit myself to you. <laughs> Can I get your number? What do you do for a living? Let's go to dinner. Let's get for lunch. Do you know the people next to you? And if it's your spouse, do you know them, know them? So we'll end with this. I didn't know where the Father wanted to go today, but the Father wants this to come from, from everything inside of Him to you. You have purpose. You have life waiting for you. If you are one of those that has leprosy on your face, You've made the mistake. You're feeling convicted in your heart right now because you've made these mistakes. You've talked about a leadership behind their back. You've made fun of someone else because of what they do or what they look like or the way that they dress or how they speak. Repent before your Lord God. Then go to someone. In ancient Israel, you would go to the rabbi and you would say, this is the mistakes I've made. I don't want to make these mistakes anymore. Today it can be, there's not enough rabbis to go around. Find a godly man, a godly woman, say, this is the mistake I've made. I don't want to make this mistake anymore. Their response, Torah, why? We go and sin no more. Come back in seven days. What is that called? Discipleship. You meet with one another. You learn one another. I can look at some of the people that I know and tell you whether they're in sin. Because I'm around them so much. Are you around people enough where you can't fool them? Yahweh loves you. And you know what He wants more than anything? To bring you to the fullest potential and blessing that He had since the day you were conceived. Stop being your worst enemy. Repent before the Lord God for the things that we say with our mouth and the things we do with our hands. Ask Him to humble your heart change your motivation, change your speak. Every time someone does something mean to you, bless them. Every time, every time you find out that somebody is, is, is said something about you, bless them, pray for them, pray for them. Pray for them to come to repentance. Why curse them? Pray that they come to repentance. Wouldn't that be better? better? Yeah. Convert an enemy to your best friend. You'll never have a better friend. Let blessing come out of your mouth because I'll end with this. You are either going to be salt water or fresh water to this earth. Whatever comes out of your mouth is either going to bring life or it's going to kill. And some of us don't realize that the things that we say travel into people's lives that you don't even know. I'll end with a story that that I don't know uh, the details very well, but I found out that, uh, that someone, um, matter of fact, uh, Donnie Grimm, are you in here? Is he here today? I don't know if he's here today. Someone was in a hospital. Their baby was born prematurely, and uh, we got the word that, that they were born prematurely and, and they needed someone to pray with them. So some women went down to the hospital to pray with them. Didn't even know this couple. Had no idea who they were. Just went down to pray with the couple. 
said, here I am. This is, this is who, who I am. I heard you were having a hard time. I'm, I'm coming to pray for you and, you and your premature baby. What that person had no idea, that act of kindness, that act of love, that act of, 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 of sending life out of their mouth to that couple. There was another family that was coming into their Hebrew root but wasn't sure whether or not it was the right thing or not because they weren't seeing a whole lot of love. And they were teeter-tottering based on things that they had heard from other people about the person that went down to the hospital. The next day, the family that was teeter-tottering, that had heard all these bad things about the person that went down to the hospital, showed up at the hospital with that family. That family, the hospital family, told this family all about their experience that someone went down and prayed with them. Cleared the name of that person, and those people are now strongly walking in the faith. (laughs) Hallelujah. One single act of love and kindness in life to someone that you maybe don't even know will change the world. Will you change the world today? How cool will it be on Judgment Day to meet all of the people that came into the kingdom that you never knew about that were there because of your mouth and your act of kindness? How terrible will it be to be on Judgment Day and meet all the people in the line next to you that could have made it but didn't because of you? Stand with me, please.